All right, joining me now from New Jersey is Nicholas Wade, and he is a science writer who has worked on nature, science, and the New York Times, and is now an author. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Look, this is a heck of an essay you've written, um, and I've read it not once, but three times now, because it's a lot to take in. But let's, let's begin with really where you leave us, um, and that is that there is simply no reasonable explanation, natural explanation uh, for COVID-19, aside from the fact that all roads lead to the laboratory in Wuhan, um, and that it was likely created or at least experimented with there and escaped from there. Well, the way I look at it is, is uh, more or less just as you said, but it, it's, uh, I think formally one should acknowledge there are sort of two uh, possible hypotheses on the table. And then when you look at which explains the evidence better on what we've got, I would say that the lab escape scenario explains the available facts much better. Proponents of na the natural emergence, that means it didn't come from the lab, but it came from maybe a bat cave or have a rather harder story to tell. The plausibility of their case rests on a single surmise, the expected parallel between the emergence of SARS-2 and that of SARS-1 and MERS, but none of the expected evidence for such a parallel history has emerged. No one has found the bat population that was the source of SARS-2, if indeed it ever infected bats. No intermediate host has presented itself despite an extensive search by Chinese authorities that included the testing of 80,000 animals. Tell me uh, on natural emergence, while you put it out there, th there just doesn't seem to be any evidence uh, that, it, that it came from a bat or came from a cave or came from a, a wild animal market. Right, there's none of the evidence you'd expect to see if it followed the pathway of its uh, two predecessors, the SARS-1 uh, epidemic and the MERS epidemic. And both, both of them left a lot of evidence uh, in nature. You could see the intermediate host animals, civets in one case, camels in the other. You could see the human populations in which the virus sort of adapted itself until it was a real pathogen. None of that is there with SARS-2. Uh, and I think everyone expected to find it. So that's why this, this WHO commission to Beijing was so interesting. It seemed at first sight a propaganda victory for the Chinese since they controlled the commission and, and the commissioners came away saying lab escape, very, very doubtful. But in fact, the, the real message was the Chinese had no evidence to give anyone in support of natural emergence. And that I think is when the sort of balance of perceptions began to change. Not only that, but all of the records from the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, are missing. They, they closed down all their databases um, and they essentially have sealed up that lab and they will not produce any of the experimentation or the post-experiment documentation that you would expect that if, if the lab was innocent of, of experimenting with this virus that they would provide. Uh, yes, that's right. I think one has to be a little uh, careful in interpreting the government's behavior. I mean, they're certainly acting guilty. Um, but, but they're an authoritarian regime, after all. They did clamp down on information after the SARS-1 epidemic. So for them sort of to clamp down uh, after SARS-2, at first blush, at least, you know, it's just sort of routine behavior on their part. On the other hand, they've done so in such a specific way. As you mentioned, they've um, closed down all the viral databases. Um, they've uh, prevented scientists from speaking. They've put out a dribble of information which may be designed to mislead or, or misdirect. The, the, their behavior certainly gives no support, whatever, to the natural emergence theory. I think it's really, I think it's really probably misleading if I keep talking around conspiracy theories or what they didn't do, because it's really important to focus, as your essay did, um, uh, you know, in, a, in a, an amazing way, you did a lot of research, focused on what they were doing they were, and could you explain it to me, absolutely experimenting with a, a SARS-2-like virus. And they were experimenting on strengthening those viruses for what purpose, which is controversial in itself. 
Right, they were doing what is um, blandly called a gain of function experiment. So yeah. in the last 20 years, viruses, uh, virologists have learned how to soup up viruses and it's, it was a very attractive thing for them uh, to do and it gains lots of, of research money. And, and the justification of this program is that it's very important for us to try and catch these pandemics ahead of time before a virus leaps from an animal host to humans like the Ebola virus or, or whatever. And we can do it in the lab, say the virologists, if you let us sort of take a virus and tweak it a little and see just what tweaks are necessary to allow it to infect humans. Now, if we do that, then that'll give us a leg up on, on where nature's going to go next. So that is the rationale under which virologists all over the world, not just in China, have been souping up these, these viruses in gain of function. And that is exactly what the Chinese were doing with these coronaviruses. You see, after the SARS-1 and MERS epidemics, both of which were caused by coronaviruses, everyone got very interested in knowing, well, you know, where, where is the next pandemic going to strike? So, so Dr. Uh, Xi Zhengli, who is the leading bat coronavirus at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, she started work with uh, a, a well-known coronavirologist in, uh, in the University of North Carolina, Ralph Barry, and the two of them um, started souping up coronaviruses largely by swapping in spike proteins from one coronavirus into the backbone of another. And they had an NIH grant to do so. Uh, the, amazingly, the NIH was funding these experiments by Dr. Xi at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The this NIH, is American funding of experiments in China. Right. The National Institutes of Health was funding Dr. Xi to do these experiments. And that's how we know she was doing them. It's all in her grant proposal. Or rather, the grant proposal goes not directly to her. It goes to something called the EcoHealth Alliance in New York, headed by Dr. Peter Daszak, and he then subcontracts the grant to Dr. Xi. These grant applications are a matter of public record, and you can see that Dr. Xi plans to soup up coronaviruses to see if they can attack humans. Now, she doesn't use human subjects, that would be unethical, but scientists instead use various surrogates. They use either human cells growing in culture, or they use humanized mice. That's, that's a mouse where you've taken out the something called the ACE2 receptor, which is a protein that studs the cells of human airways, and you take out the mouse version and you put in the human version. So all these genetically engineered mice are like little humans as far as their airways are concerned. So she was testing these souped up viruses in humanized mice and human cells. This was exactly the track you'd be on if you were going to create a SARS-2 like virus. So either she created the SARS-2 virus itself or something pretty like it. Why don't we know? Why are the records not? I mean, the Chinese government doesn't want to release the records, but why don't we know? Well, we know for, um, I guess, three reasons. Um, firstly, we know from the grant proposals, uh, the NIH grant proposals, which are a matter of public record, that say exactly what she was going to do. Uh, we know from uh, a paper she published in 2017, where she'd um, reported swapping in the uh, uh, spike proteins uh, into four viruses and creating four of these hybrid viruses. And we know because of Dr. Dashak himself, who just before news of the pandemic hit in December 2019, gave an interview in which he enthused about how well these experiments were going in cooking up novel coronaviruses that could infect humanized mice. Of course, he, he sang a very different tune as soon as the, the virus had, as we think, escaped, but that's what he said before the escape. It's important to note that Dashak, the president of the EcoHealth Alliance, was sort of the person who came out and told the world's media, you know, don't look at the lab. The lab couldn't be involved, and he declared that in the Lancet, I understand, right? But he, he obviously had competing interests because he was involved in the research. Yes, I think he had an enormous competing interest, which should have been declared in that Lancet letter, and uh, in fact was not. And indeed, the letter concludes by saying, we declare no competing interests. Can you give me something on this bat cave? 
where all of these coronavirus samples had, my understanding, had come from. And in fact, they had miners who had been in the cave. Some of them got sick, some of them died. And that health information was then covered up as well. Yes, this is a very interesting um, story, uh, not least because it's clear the Chinese tried to conceal it. You know, the whole, the whole purpose of, of Dr. Xi's research was to find dangerous coronaviruses that might attack the human population. So when these six miners um, died, presumably, presumably she and Dr. Daszak were right on the case. It was of intense interest to them. It, that's what they were looking for all along. Uh, so she analyzed um, eight uh, viruses from this cave. Um, they were not directly from the miner's blood, but they were bat viruses from the cave. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, she published just little snippets of them, not the whole virus. Um, it was harder to sequence things in those days. But what people did was to just sequence one gene as a kind of index um, to the virus as a whole. Um, so she called this she called uh, one of these viruses she had um, a bat, bat coronavirus 4991. So then nothing more was heard about that very interesting virus until you sort of fast forward to the present time when the Chinese, presumably they need to establish that the SARS-2 virus was not a lab creation, it came from a bat. So they needed to establish a nice sort of family tree for it. So they needed to put, put out there a sort of ancestor that was sort of close enough to SARS-2 to, to look like it was a, a sort of close ancestor, but not so close that anyone would claim SARS-2 had been derived from it. So lo and behold, Dr. Xi publishes, I forget when this was, in January, February, she publishes a new bad virus she has called RATG13, and it fulfills exactly the role I described to you it, it establishes a sort of true bat genealogy for SARS-2, but it's not too close to it. Well, then people started ferreting around and they found that this RAT G13 was in fact identical to the one isolated eight years before from the Yunnan cave that you mentioned. It was identical with what she'd called bat coronavirus 4991, except in her, in her paper with the, the, the RATG13, she made no mention of the earlier finding. So that is a no-no in scientific terms. You don't just sort of switch names on something you're studying. You can switch the name if you want, but you need to say to your readers, this is what I'm doing, and she didn't. So, so this is why everyone has been very interested in this virus and exactly what the Chinese were trying to do, accomplish in publishing it.